evening, everyone. If you're logging in from the East Coast, it's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But wherever you are logging in from, we are so glad that you joined us. I am Brenda Viola with Lympha Press, and I'm so honored to host tonight's webinar with someone who I have sort of been stalking for a while, Dr. Shelly DiCecco. I heard her speak at the AVLS conference a couple years ago on this very topic, and it's such an important one that I really wanted our audience to be privy to the latest information from Dr. DiCecco on pelvic dysfunction and lymphedema. Uh, as you are logging on, please let us know you are here put your names and chat where you are located. And also know that we are recording tonight's webinar. It will be sent to you once we edit it and post it to our YouTube channel. And what else do I need to tell you? Yes, questions. We want your questions and comments. So please put them in the Q&A and we will address questions at the end. But without further ado, Dr. Shelley DiCecco is the Assistant Professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. But she doesn't commute to Philadelphia. I learned <laughs> that. I'm a Philly person and I thought, oh, Philadelphia. No, Atlanta, correct? Yes. So Dr. DiCecco's clinical experience includes orthopedics, lymphedema, and pelvic dysfunctions in both private practice and hospital settings. And when we were preparing for going live tonight, Dr. DiCecco said, I love talking about genitals. And I said, someone's got to. And the point is, it's not often talked about. As said in the promotional materials, the genital region and sexuality is still taboo in many cultures and medical practices. This applies to the world of lymphedema also. Lymphedema research is lacking in incidents, symptoms, and treatment of genital lymphedema for both males and females. I don't want to steal any of Dr. DiCecco's thunder, but I will say this. You're going to answer a lot of questions that people have in advance, and I know it will provoke many more questions. So thank you to all who have logged on and who are joining us tonight. We're grateful that you're giving us your time. It will be well worth it. I am going to disappear. Dr. DiCecco, take it away. Okay. I want to thank Brenda and Lympha Press for sponsoring this. Um, I'm going to go a little bit fast just because there's so much to cover, but I will answer any questions and I'm always available for email uh, conversations and stuff too. So I have been doing genital lymphedema for over 20 years now that I started actually as a pelvic floor therapist and then got my lymphedema certification. And because of my pelvic floor interest that literally genital lymphedema kind of fell in my lap. And I have, uh, actually my PhD was in, uh, dissertation was on genital lymphedema and it's just kind of snowballed from there. So let's begin. So first, a lot of times, some of the issues is really understanding the anatomy of the genitals, that most all of us are comfortable with the shoulder, the knee and other parts of the body that we kind of start to kind of wonder and question what's going on when we get towards the genitals. So if you have a better understanding of the anatomy, it's a little bit easier to kind of follow. So one first, you have to remember you have your bony landmarks that often when we're talking about the lower abdomen, genital and upper thigh region, the bodies are slightly distorted by the time they get into our clinics because of the different procedures they've undergone, the extent of the lymphedema or lipedema, and so sometimes it's overwhelming of what am I actually looking at? What part of the body really is this supposed to be? So by knowing your bony landmarks, you can pretty much always find where you are. So the big ones I've marked in stars, and you're going to see them throughout the next several slides. So if you know your iliac crest, your pubic symphysis, your ischial tuberosities, your pubic bones, your coccyx and your sacrums, you can pretty much figure out what muscles, lymphotomes, or organs you are near. So you have to keep in mind your pelvis has over 46, it's closer to 50 some odd muscles attached to the bones of the pelvis. Your shoulders and knee both have less than 20 each. 
So it's like any other group project. When you're trying to get 50 people to work together, it's not always very easy to do that. Someone does too much. Someone doesn't do enough. Someone didn't even know they were part of the group. So the same things with lymphedema with our patients is a lot of times these muscles are not working as they should in synergy. And this can actually cause problems increasing the swelling but they certainly don't help us get rid of the swelling. And we always target the arm muscles and the leg muscles for leg and arm lymphedema. But a lot of times we forget to target these muscles when we're dealing with genital lymphedema. If you also know your bony landmarks, you can find your lymphotomes because often with the distortion, you're not really sure where does this part of the body naturally drain. So most of our lymphotomes are divided by large muscle groups and by changes in bony prominences. So if you know where to palpate, you can actually find some of the key lines for your different lymphotomes to help kind of guide where does this uh, aspect of the body normally drain and can I go in that route or may I need to reroute it to get to a different route to get it out of the genitals and our leg or lower abdomen. A group of muscles that we often overlook is your pelvic floor muscles. They are at the bottom of your pelvis. They support all of the organs. They aid with your uh, abdominal muscles as the biggest part of your core muscles that you cannot move an arm, a leg, your head, or anything without your pelvic floor and your transverse abdominus responding. So often with our patients that have genital lymphedema, they've had some type of pelvic cancers whether it's gyno, uro, colorectal, and these muscles have been distorted or just from general lack of use, these muscles have weakened and so they're not functioning as they should. And these are key ones to help us with our lymphedema. You have your coccygeus muscle, your levator ani muscle group and your perineal muscles. The pelvis is also loaded with organs. There is not much space for fluid. So when we start adding fluid into this region, it can really start to wreak havoc as we'll discuss later on some of the different organ systems. And again, you can see your bony prominence. So right behind your pubic symphysis is your bladder. Right in front of your coccyx is going to be your colon. Your uterus for females is in the middle. Obviously I did not draw these images or they'd be stick figures. But often when you see anatomical drawings, you can see the blue arrows at the bottom pointing to the pelvic floor. Your pelvic floor muscles are actually larger in comparison than what the images typically draw, but often they're kind of added as an afterthought in anatomical drawings, but they do actually go up higher onto the bladder area to help support these organs so that we can control for bowel incontinence or bladder issues. Here is the male. Similar that the coccyx is right by the rectum, the bladder is still behind the pubic symphysis. The difference I always like to point out for the male anatomy is you see the prostate is below the bladder between the bladder and the pelvic floor muscles. When they remove the um, prostate, you now have about a half inch to an inch space that has a void from the prostate being gone. So these gentlemen don't just need standard strength of the pelvic floor, they actually need hypertrophy to make those muscles bigger to help reach the bladder to limit their dysfunctions after prostate surgeries. This image is showing the pelvis from a transverse view. We've cut the pelvis in half. You can see the bony prominences and you can see the different muscles along with your piriformis and obturator internus which are both hip muscles, but they're right alongside your uh, pelvic floor muscles. This image is showing your pelvic lymphatics. You can see the lumbar nodes coming down into your two common iliacs, separating into your internal and external iliac nodes. You can see when we overlay, your muscles are right where your nodes and your pelvic vessels are ending into the pelvic cavity. This is showing a lot of my research at the school is on cadavers. Um, this is a female cadaver that we have removed the organs and we have used furniture, or not furniture, excuse me, clothing tags to mark the different nodes and we've color coordinated them. 
So you can see the purple arrow is pointing to the thoracic duct. It gives you an idea that's the aorta, the other vessel you see, of how small the thoracic duct actually is next to the aorta. Then you have the blue tags are pointing to the lumbar nodes, the yellow to the common iliac, the red to the external iliac, the pink to your sacral nodes. There's not a ton of colors that we can choose from from clothing tags, so we did have to use brown, which on the actual cadaver is easy to see, but obviously not as well in imaging. And the same thing with the clear for superficial inguinal and the deep inguinal. If we cut the pelvis, as you saw in the picture before, here you can see the nodes again. And when I overlay the muscles, you can see again, right how close all of these different nodes for this female are right with the pelvic floor muscles. So by getting contractions of your pelvic floor muscles, you can actually provide some pressure and some changes to get the fluid to pump out of the pelvic cavity. So if you look in textbooks, you're going to see that the functions of the pelvic floor muscles are to support contents in the pelvis, to help with bowel and bladder control, to aid in sexual functions and aid in childbirth for females. I challenge textbooks to start putting in that they actually have a fifth function, which is to drain the lymphatics of the genitals and the pelvis. So that's kind of the anatomy. So what happens when these things start to have dysfunctions? Too often I hear either when I'm out in public or family events or different things for healthcare that it's normal for women to have incontinence. Incontinence is never normal, no matter what age you are, that it is an abnormal sign that needs to be addressed on why they're leaking that if our patients were stumbling every fifth step of walking as therapists, we would want to address that. So it's the same thing with this, that there's a reason the bladder or the bowel is leaking, either it's weakness, it can be scar tissue, neurological issues, swelling issues, but something's causing this and it needs to be addressed. Same thing with constipation, that every single adult should have at least one to two bowel movements per day without straining. If not, you are in some stage of constipation, that it can be from muscle weakness, it can be from diet, um, other activities, but our medication, but it is something that needs to be addressed. Bleeding from this area is always a sign that needs to be checked out, that it often is a sign for the different colorectal cancers from the GYN type cancers, or that something is just not as it should. It could be as simple as not enough lubrication in the area or hormones for the tissues to be healthy. And pain is something I wish we could go back and tell all young ladies and everyone else, you should never have pain in the pelvis area. The intercourse should never hurt. Bowel movements should not hurt. Anything in that region should not have pain associated with it. That if there is pain, something's going on again that needs to be addressed. So we are in December, so I did try to add a few of the different holiday tags. Um, there's nothing but Christmas. The Hanukkah and the other holidays around this time obviously do not want to have bathroom signs put up for them. So unfortunately, that most of the ones I've added are all going to be Christmas themed. Um, the different types of incontinence. Urge incontinence is where you have an urge to go and you're going to have leakage or complete loss. Stress incontinence is where you have the loss due to a change in pressure. These changes occur from changing position from like sit to stand, laughing, coughing, or sneezing. A lot of, uh, especially women will say, oh, I don't have incontinence. I just dribble a little when I laugh. That is actually a form of incontinence. Mix means you have a combination of both. And there's several other ones that we won't get into today that have to do with either medication, neurological, and other components with urinary frequency, an adult should go to the bathroom no more than once every two hours. That I know tonight after this converse or webinar or whenever you are watching this, you should as an adult actually urinate for eight full Mississippi seconds. That means you had at least 250 milliliters in your bladder, which is the amount you should have before your first signal goes to your brain that you need to urinate. If you are going to the bathroom with less than eight seconds, 
you didn't have a stretch to tell you to go. Something else is sending the signal or causing you to go to the bathroom. And again, it needs to be looked at because you should be able to go every two hours or at least for eight seconds. Why is incontinence so important? Because incontinence can cause depression in our patients, especially with lymphedema. They already have depression issues sometimes, and this can add to it. There's a lot of social isolation associated with incontinence because patients don't want to smell or leak in front of friends or family. Due to the acidity of the urine and or bowel, you are at risk for skin breakdown and infections. Incontinence is still one of the major reasons that people are institutionalized because of either the family member or caregiver doesn't want to deal with the incontinence anymore with changing diapers or the patient has a fall either slipping in the urine on the way to the restroom or in the process of rushing to the restroom. If someone has incontinence, there's often a reduction in sexual drive. They don't feel intimate when they know there's a chance they could leak. And if you add all of this together, you can see why this can have a significant decrease on one's quality of life. Another component that can be common with our patients is prolapse. This is where your organs have slipped out of their position and have dropped down. For females, it's typically going to be dropping down into the vaginal canal. So it can be your bladder, your uterus. If the uterus is gone, it can actually be your intestines and it can also be your colon that Often with our patients with lymphedema, we may not see these symptoms or even the incontinence symptoms because of the fluid helping to support the organs. And then as we start to do therapy, these symptoms may start to come on because the fluid has reduced and the organs can start to shift. Um, these things can be treated with pelvic floor therapists if you are not comfortable treating it yourself, but a patient should not be forced to live with either incontinence, pelvic pain, or prolapse of organs. So how do these relate to our lymphedema and lipedema type patients? Most of the studies that have been done on um, sexuality have actually been done more on lipedema patients than lymphedema patients that several studies found that most women with lipedema, um, report pelvic floor disorders, about 40 to 60% of them do. Of those, about 13% will have a bowel disorder and the others have either a combination or straight urinary incontinence conditions. There's about 30% of patients with lipedema have a hormonal imbalance. 18% were found to have abnormal menstruation cycles. Several of the studies found sexual dysfunction, although they did not give it a statistics. It has an increased risk of polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's an increased risk of depression and obviously an increased risk of eating disorders. The ones above depression are most caused by your adipose tissue in the area is what's causing it. And so you can correlate some of this to your lymphedema population because it is common, especially in the pelvic region to have abnormal laydown of adipose tissue or regular adipose tissue from diet and exercise. So these uh, statistics should relate some to your lymphedema population because they often can have some of the same symptoms in the area. Some other ways that pelvic floor dysfunctions increase with lymphedema and lipedema is when you have increase adipose tissue or swelling in the pelvic region, you can impact the intra-abdominal pressure. This is gonna add pressure onto the organs and the pelvic floor. So they may be more likely to leak urine. They may be more likely for prolapse, pelvic pain and other dysfunctions because of this change in pressure. As we age in general, the fast twitch fibers reduce, but also when you're dealing with swelling and malnutrition in the area, you have an increased reduction in the fast twitch fibers. Your pelvic floor muscles, your bladder detrusor are the muscle on your bladder that helps contract it when we need to go. And your sphincters are all high in fast twitch fibers. There's common to have weakness in the pelvic floor. Um, two of the main reasons for it is repetitive straining from constipation that a lot of times our patients think because they're swollen that they shouldn't drink as much water when they should be drinking more. 
when you are constipated, you're more like, or excuse me, when you are dehydrated, you're more likely to be constipated. Um, there also, as we talked before, there can be the reduced sexuality component. And when you're not having intercourse, your muscles um, can reduce in strength because they're not being used. Then when you also look at the edema itself, that you end up, if we saw from the pictures with the organs, there's not a lot of empty space. So when you add in fluids, you end up with congestion in the area. You can have fluid around a muscle. And if I remember correctly from back when I took boards over 20 some odd years ago, I think it's two cc's of fluid can actually inhibit your quad. So when you're talking about how much fluid some of our patients may have, it's way more than two cc's that's floating around these muscles. And so they can inhibit their ability to contract correctly. The fluid's gonna increase pressure on the organs. And one of the big ones is also gonna increase pressure on the nerves. Your pudendal nerve does not like to be bothered. When it does, it can cause several different types of symptoms. It can cause numbness, tingling, and pain anywhere pretty much into the pelvic region. Most of the time it's going to be more distal. It's gonna be more into the perineum, the labia area, vaginal opening, testicles, base of the scrotum or the penis, but it can actually refer into the abdomen, buttocks and thighs. You also can have changes in bowel or bladder function that they may have trouble voiding. I've had patients before with lymphedema that when they flew, they actually had to go straight to a hospital because the swelling had increased so much that they were unable to empty their bladder. Um, so it can cause the dis or inability to void, but it can also cause you to have too much voiding or leakage because of the way it compresses onto the bladder. For bowel, it can make it harder for the bowel to pass because your colon is not a rigid structure. So the increased fluid can push on the walls and distort where it should be located or the position or the um, shape it should be. So sometimes as simple as asking your patient what their bowel looks like, that it should be in the shape of a cylinder, but it could come out in ribbons and balls, which will show that there is a distortion in the colon and bowel is being backed up and causing issues. You may, as we talked about, see a reduction in symptoms as you start to get the fluid out of the area. Your patient is not going to appreciate this change, but you need to help educate them that this is actually a sign of progress for them to have a reduction in symptoms. By having um, urinary and bowel functions, we are bowel dysfunctions, everyone has a function. By having the dysfunction, there is a significant increase for risk for infections and your skin breakdown. That sometimes you may need to put some type of barrier cream such as zinc oxide or something in the area to help protect the sensitive skin, especially if it's been radiated in the past, so that when there's urine or bowel in the area, it's not as likely to break it down more and cause infections. You want to avoid cellulitis as much as possible in this region that the studies show that once you've had cellulitis in the genital region, your risk of having more is substantially increased and your more risk for distortion of shape and possible being encouraged to have surgery to treat it. Obviously there's an increased risk of falling for any population, but we don't want our patients that we often have in bandages or other um, forms of compression and often their limb is distorted, so walking's already kind of a little off for them, that their risk of falling's already increased, you add urinary incontinence, you've made it even worse. And then the psychosocial component, we know that lymphedema causes a psychosocial impact on our patient, and having a bowel or urinary dysfunction is just going to double down on that. There was a study done in 2014 on Bernard with 199 females, and he found that surgical outcomes for sling repair, which sling repairs are used for prolapse, that they take um, material to wrap around the bladder and hook it up onto um, tissues inside the pelvis, usually around the pubic symphysis area. 
But if you think about it, your bladder is a very soft organ, so they can't make it out of very um, hard or non-pliable material, or it would actually cut into the bladder. So it's kind of like, it always reminds me of more like saran wrap or something of what they're using. And so if the patients don't have post-op care where they're learning how to use their pelvic floor and abdominal muscles correctly, the general population has a significant fail risk but they also found from this study when the BMI is greater than 30, that that's a significant increase on top of that, that some of it was up to even 85% fail rate. They also had the post-op complication increase of urge incontinence so that every time they felt the urge, they could not control their urine. A study on the rectal prolapse by Mitchell in 2013 found that when one um, had an eating disorder, it slowed down their colonic or the speed in which bowel moves through your intestines and that that would improve once their nutrition levels improve. So some of our patients with constipation, by looking at diet and trying to make sure they are eating proper foods, enough fluids, enough stimulants of your fruits, and eating some, um, some grains if they can and other things to improve bowel health, we may be able to reduce that constipation, which reduces the straining, which puts less pressure on the organs and less pressure on the nerves and muscles in the area, and also can help with fluid movement. Hormonal dysfunction that, um, as discussed previously, there can be an increased lay down in adipose tissue, whether it's from prolonged lymphedema in the region, whether it is from lipedema, or just general adipose tissue that one may develop, adipose tissue has hormones in it, especially estrogen. So when you have an increase of adipose, you have altered your normal hormone levels. This can cause significant changes in your menstrual cycle and the endometrial lining. It has been linked to um, difficulties with becoming pregnant, maintaining the pregnancy to term, during pregnancy or during delivery can increase your risk of complications and your postpartum outcomes are often um, worse when someone is overweight. That we know that it increases the risk and the size of polyps and fibroids into the OBG or GYN system. That it can cause lactation periods to be delayed, reduce, shorter, and even make it where women are not able to properly breastfeed. And there's a significant correlation with um, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome and infertility. Some research done by Goads in 2020 found that 18% had abnormal menstrual cycles um, that had increased bleeding and irregular frequency duration. And after he performed SAPL on these ladies with lipedema, that 53% of them reported a significant of symptoms. Shakura fibroids with women and found there was a three time increase of occurrence in women that had weighed more than 150 pounds. Then in 2009, Onilin did a study where uh, women with a BMI greater than 30 were more likely to develop polyps at 52% versus 15% with women with a BMI less than 30. Sexual dysfunction, that some of the causes on why our patients may have some sexual dysfunction. One is the hormonal balance. You've also got to add in, depending on what kind of other treatments they have going on, are they taking a hormone chemo for the rest of their lives? Have they had uh, their ovaries removed or their prostate removed or other components that are impacting um, hormones, adipose as we just went over, but the hormones can be off balance leading to sexual dysfunction for both males and females. Depression, again, it can be over the lipedema or lymphedema. It can be over other health-related conditions or depression on things that have nothing to do with health. Some of our patients, especially if they're going through cancer treatments, may not have the energy for intimacy, or if it takes all of their effort to walk from their driveway back to their house because of the size of their limb, they may have used all their energy. 
the lack of feeling attractive or intimate that causes your libido to decrease. Some of our patients have hypersensitivity. So just the thought of being touched or being touched causes pain. Others with more um, direct pressure or deeper pressure can have pain based off of what the fluid is pushing on of nerve wise or scar tissue, uh, skin disruptions or other components that are common with our populations. You can also have vascular nerve related and including hormonal dysfunctions that are gonna change your ability to actually respond to intimate situations. The response has reduced that a patient or male patient may not be able to obtain a full erection or a female may not be able to become aroused. The lubrication is reduced sometimes and the actual ability to participate fully is reduced for our patients. One of the big problems too is either difficulty getting into a position or fear by the patient and or their partner of being harmed with different positions that as therapists, most of us were taught in our initial training and in school that we have to work with our cardiac patients on helping them achieve appropriate positions to return to intercourse. But somehow when it comes to lymphedema, that knowledge and education or understanding that it is part of our practice, we forget to talk with our lymphedema patients about sexual position, even your breast cancer and other ones that are they trying to be intimate in positions that either could increase their lymphedema or could increase their discomfort because of the way that position alters their body and doesn't make them feel their most attractive. That Godes in 2020 on his study with, with lipedema found that the quality of life their sex life actually improved after the SAPL, although he again didn't give stats. And then Eficito in 2006 found that for women over this BMI of 25, they had a reduction in arousal, lubrication, ability to achieve orgasm and overall satisfaction with intercourse as compared to females with BMIs less than 25. Several years ago, when I was doing research on all of this, this quote has stuck with me, and I often put it in most of my talks, but this was what was stated by a patient with lipedema when she was being asked about intimacy, that I wish I could get really aroused, but at the same time, I would not have the energy for it. Yes, it affects my life tremendously, my whole life, our life, of course, not feeling desired by the man you are in love with. I tried to ask him. It feels like you don't think I'm attractive in any way. He is so kind and would never say it directly to me. Instead, he asked me, what do you want me to say? Then I realized, no, he's not attracted to me, but he is in love with me. It was awful, but at the same time, it became clear then. And I try to remember this quote, whenever I'm with patients to make sure, am I helping them with these type of issues so that it does improve intimacy for that patient, no matter who they may be with, or if they're just by themselves, that sometimes we just want to feel attractive just for us, not for someone else. And so making sure that I'm addressing the whole person and helping them become what they were prior to most of this starting off for them. So what about when we're looking directly at genital lymphedema? So if you look at the literature, genital lymphedema is sometimes only 10% and sometimes it is at 40% of those with lower extremity lymphedema. I would reckon that it's actually much higher than that. It's that most people either don't ask about it or they don't check about it. That for males, it can be in the penis alone was usually found in studies to be about 5%. Scrotals were 30% and both were about 60% of the males actually diagnosed with genital lymphedema. For females, you can't find statistics. A lot of that is because no one knows how to truly quantify uh, edema when it's still in the vagina before it comes into the labias. And how do you actually measure the labias to truly get as much of a volume component as we can because of the shape of them? So women are rarely listed in their stats on that. 
one of the reasons it's underdiagnosed is because of the topic of conversation that we were taught since an early age that genitals are taboo. You were not supposed to show your genitals or discuss your genitals with other people. So the doctors and the patients aren't talking about it. The doctor doesn't want to ask or know how to ask. And the patient is, if they didn't ask, then I don't want to bring it up because it's probably not normal if it's not being brought up. And the same thing with the therapist, that they're not comfortable asking the patient about it and the patient's not comfortable just kind of showing it. And sometimes the patients don't know. They haven't looked at that area. They haven't seen that they're swelling. They don't know that it's there or that it could be, especially for females, they don't realize it can be internal and that their vagina isn't as open as it was. It's more pressure feeling. They don't know that's not normal. So it is rarely mentioned in books and even more rare with studies, which I'm trying to change all that. So what should we do with evaluations? You're still going to do your standard evaluation that you would do for any of your patients with lipedema or lymphedema, but you also have to add in some other things. You do need to discuss bowel and bladder more than you ever wanted to. You need to discuss sexual abilities. Are they able to become aroused? Are they able to fully participate or is there pain or other things limiting them? And are they able to achieve orgasm? Especially for your male population, if they cannot achieve orgasm, they have things that we need to address. Some females may never have had one prior to, and I've had uh, females after we've worked to them, they've been able to actually have orgasms even though they never had them before. And they are extremely um, happy. And so are their spouses or partners because of that. You need to ask about infections that UTIs, especially cellulitis, uh, skin infections, what is going on down there? It can give you an idea of to the involvement. Sometimes it's just of the fluids. Sometimes it's hygiene. What are other symptoms? Is there numbness? Is there tingling? Is there achingness? A bursting sensation is common in the genitals because of nerve conditions. And what's the psychosocial component of it? We actually have to see it that I will often start with doing pitting testing where their underwear is still on. If there is pitting in the more lateral aspects or the superior aspects of the genital, then I explain to the patient, I really need to see more. Sometimes I may just move the underwear more out of the way because of their comfort level, or I may ask them to remove the underwear altogether. But if you're not looking at it and just taking the patient's word for it, you may be missing some things. You need to know where is the swelling? What's the condition of the skin? Is there discharge? Is the skin um, have breaks or lesions or discolorations? Is there papillomas or cysts? Is there indentation from clothing? What's the symmetry of their body? Do they have a panis that's over the genital region? Is there pitting? Is there fibrosis? Can the skin move just like we do with any other area? Is there a stimmer sign? Um, if you are trained in internal techniques, you can do pit testing in the vagina. If you are not a pelvic floor trained therapist, please undergo formal training before you try to do a pit test inside the vagina. We do want to document everything with girth and you may need to check the pelvic floor muscles so that you can add those muscles in to assist with drainage. Some colleagues and I to help get the conversations going and to help make patients realize that genital swelling is a normalized component a lot of times when there's not a tool or you've given them another quality of life tool that addresses everything but that besides maybe one question, they think it's not normal to have it, that it's so minor that it either is not a question or it's only one or two. So you can download the two um, tools, the lower limb and genital lymphedema questionnaire for men, and you can also download the one for women. It does have the scoring so you can give quality of life scores for insurances, but it has a lot of information that the patients can mark on it to let them realize what is going on is normal, but it also gives you a better picture of what you may be finding and need to look more into. One of the biggest issues I see with patients with genital lymphedema that have gone undergone treatment from other therapists is the therapist did not address the genitals, but went straight to the legs. 
the genitals are at the top, it's going to dump into the genitals. We do not treat the arm without treating the breast first or at the same time. So if you're not comfortable treating the genitals, do have them go to someone who is because you can make things much worse by adding more fluid to the region. So with your MLD, you may need to add in more lymph nodes so that you're getting, as I always say, more people to the party to kind of help, but you've got to make sure that you're addressing all those nodes we were looking at and all ones in the surrounding areas that could help move fluid out of the region. Working on your breathing, so whether you're doing um, upper trunk, middle trunk, and lower trunk, so your thoracic, diaphragmatic, and abdominal breathing, so that you're getting the different regions to kind of help clear out. Making sure you're addressing those 46 plus muscles we talked about at the beginning. Are you using the gluteals? Are you using the transverse abdominis, the pelvic floor muscles, the piriformis? Are you using them to help move the fluid out of the pelvis and genitals as we would for the arm? Compression can really be the part that drives you slightly insane because every time it starts to shrink, it's gonna completely change what may work. So bandaging, it's got to be something that will hold the patient or their caregiver has to be able to do it. They have to be able to change it if it gets soiled and they have to be able to go to the bathroom. The daytime garment needs to support the genitals because gravity is not our friend. We don't want it to stretch the skin in any more than it already has. The garments need to be breathable. This area is already warm and moist and it's more prone for infections than your leg or your arm are typically. The nighttime needs to help more with reduction in skin health. And then with your exercises, when you're doing them, make sure that you're going in the same direction as we do with everything else, with the proximal to distal component. Education's a big one, that making sure they know some things like bathing, they don't need to use the same washcloth or towel over and over, or, and they shouldn't share them with loved ones. Don't use anything in that region that has a fragrance because fragrance are not um, controlled by the FDA. And we don't know what chemical is in each fragrance that could cause irritations to these tissues. Hot water can dry it out and um, harm the tissue. So making sure they're using temperatures that are more tepid or at least something that wouldn't burn. Toilet paper is a big one that I always tell patients to rub their toilet paper on dark um, jeans or pants. If it leaves a residue there, it left residue on your tissues and the genitals that higher, it's not always more expensive, but higher quality toilet paper has less residue and it doesn't irritate the tissues. They can also use cool water to rinse the area or the wipes that are readily available. A big one is you have to change hygiene products, your pads and tampons and diapers have to be changed for males and females every two to three hours, four hours at max, whether they're dry or soiled, that I always joke it's like a party barge that you have bacteria from the rectum, bacteria from the urethra, and for females, bacteria from the vagina come down, hop on this party barge, and they go home with different partners at the end of the evening. This is how you can get C. diff in the bladder and you can get all kinds of other gnarly infections in this region because of their ability to change. If they think they have an infection, they do need to see a doctor to see if they need any type of antifungal, antibiotics or other ointments. Eating yogurt, not putting yogurt in the genital region, please, but eating yogurt can help keep your natural bacteria count high to help fight off some of the infections. We do have to do education on sexuality, that what lubricants, lubricants to use, we don't want ones that have the warming sensation and the stuff to help it stick more to the tissues. Those can all be irritants. We want to stick more with a water-based with no additives. Our olive oil is the oldest lubricant around. I have seen a study, I cannot find it again, where coconut oil did grow, I can't remember if it was fungus or bacteria in the mouth. Um, it was done for dental um, components. And so I try to not use coconut oil in those regions. They always use, need to use the restroom and clean off after intimacy. You, like we discussed before with the sexual positions, where is a position that's not going to put pressure on the involved areas, that's not going to cause gravity to pull on them or cause pain or too much compression. 
You can also use self and partner MLD pre and post to kind of add as part of the foreplay or intimacy, but that also helps keep the swelling afterwards more towards a minimum from the fact that there will be engorgement. Um, if anyone does want to have long handouts on these things, that if anyone needs handouts for um, hygiene and sexuality, if you email me, I'm happy to add your logo to it and send it back to you. So the overall key points in the last 30 seconds before I get pulled off is you need to know and understand and be comfortable with all of this. You need to be able to talk to your patients about these important aspects, practice it in the car, as opposed to yelling at the person that's cutting you off. You can try to educate them on their genitals. Um, you cannot assume someone else is addressing these issues that you need to address it also. And if you're at a loss, you can phone or email a colleague don't just ignore the issue. I'm always available by email. I've done multiple phone calls and video chats with patients and or their um, therapist that don't just avoid it because you're not comfortable with it. This is an area that does need to be addressed. That is my girl cat that has fallen asleep with my genital models because who wouldn't think that a large scrotum full of cotton is not comfortable to lay on. So she's taking a nice nap with some scrotums. So I will stop at this point. Dr. DiCecco, first of all, I <laughs> appreciate, and I know our audience does as well, the breadth of information here, very practical information, but also you interspersed humor at different <laughs> junctures. I found myself chuckling and I bet a lot of members of our audience did as well with some of your little cartoons and then alternately heartbroken at some of the visuals and how extreme this condition can be in so many people. It, it really is. I'm so glad you're focusing on it. So we have some questions that have come in from the audience and we want to address them. Amy Cotton, thank you for being here tonight, Amy. Once a little clarification. She says, when you say 10 to 40% of males with lower extremity lymphedema also have genital lymphedema, is it 10 to 40% of males with lower limb lymphedema in specific or any lymphedema in general? with lower limb specific. So if they have leg involvement, some of the studies show up to 40% of them also have some form of genital involvement. And since we know it's underrepresented in literature, you really need to assume that it's much higher for your lower limb lymphedema patients, that they're closer to 60% or more. They just don't know it. Um, especially your older population or your overweight population may not realize that it has started to change in size and shape. Thank you for that clarification. And Britta Wallace, thank you for being with us, Britta, tonight. Do you recommend the Jovi Pack genital pads for clients? And do you have a recommended brand of bike short style compression for these clients? Basically so with pads and stuff, I do use pads. Typically for my patients, I call it arts and craft time. I typically make my pads and inserts first because I want to make sure that we're addressing what works best for them. So I'll use the different convoluted foams, the different density to foams, different foam packs, cherry pits, all kinds of stuff and make different components first to see what actually works. Do I need something that's going to improve flow better? Is it going to address fibrosis? What is the goal? Once we figure it out of what works for them, then I start showing them the stuff they could buy that fits that category. That there's not anything on the market um, pad wise that I find works from all of them. And everything on the market works for someone. So I have all the samples typically in the clinic or where I can pull them up because some of them I keep here at my house. Um, but I like to see what works before I start buying them or having the patient buy them because the Jovi pack may work for some, but the Sigvaris or Jopes version um, may work better for some. So there's not a definite same thing with your biker shorts that Biker shorts are difficult to fit patients because they come in so many different sizes and shapes our patients do. 
So a lot of times I send my patients to like a TJ Maxx or Marshalls where they have a large selection of girdles and biker type shorts to start seeing first what sizes they may fit in, what they may like, how high do they want it, how low do they want it, so that we can look again at something more inexpensive before we start looking at the more lymphedema specific ones that are gonna cost more money and may need to be custom. And then they don't wanna wear it because it comes too high on their waist. It's pin or cutting into their ribs. It's rolling up on the leg or it's too long on the leg and it shows out from under my shorts. Um, so again, I kind of vary, do I need a custom? Do I need an off the shelf? I've even have some of my males wear postpartum garments because they need that strong elastic component that are in postpartum garments for variscosities. So I know it'd be easy if I could give you one product for each, but I have a huge list and ideas and stuff that we use for my different patients because they come in so many different sizes and needs. Do they have incontinence? Do they have to get to the bathroom? Do they need something thinner because they're going to work and can't wear a thick pad? So I'm always available if you have an idea and or want to know more about a particular patient, I can help try to guide you, but it really is kind of hit or miss and kind of playing with the stuff to see what works best. And I have to wedge in a little comment here because Lympha Press is sponsoring tonight's webinar and we have seen amazing results for people with genital lymphedema using pneumatic compression therapy. We have a lympha pants that goes right below the chest all the way down to the lower end of the lower extremities. And they have expanders for the larger patient. We can fit almost any size. We even have a lympha pod, which is like a sleeping bag, but inside the compression can work to really help these patients get some relief to move the edema and they can do it themselves in the comfort of home as well. You know, we love working with therapists. Your hands on work then can help be maintained by the at home product like the Lympha Press. So I'm actually going to put marketing at Lympha Press email in the chat. So if you would like more information or if we can help serve your patients, please reach out to us. We have another question, Pamela, Ter and by the way, if you ever want to mention anything about pneumatic compression and what you've seen with your patients, Dr. DeCecco, feel free to mm -hmm. jump in on that. I just sort of had to do that little commercial, but Pamela <laughs> Terry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said, that's okay. Okay. Pamela Terry asks, what do women use for wrapping or padding? And what do we do if we have hand or shoulder arthritis? It's difficult to get the compression on. Uh, that can be an issue. So um, sometimes I will use, again, some of the pregnancy and postpartum garments on my females that have Velcro involved. Um, because they are trying to address the woman either growing or shrinking, whether she's pregnant or has delivered the child. So sometimes those can work for females with it. Um, inserts, uh, different pads and stuff can be used to kind of help it fit better. You can wrap the area, but the patient needs to be more sedentary during that part. So if you've got someone that is bed bound acute care, you can wrap. Um, or if it's someone that could lay while they're doing their MLD or other things where you could wrap it some before or after to kind of give a little extra oomph, you can. It's just the females can't walk well when you've wrapped that area because of the way it will actually start to slide and cut off there at the hip and inguinal area. Um, so again, it comes down to a lot of really plain. I've had seamstresses that were patients that helped me sew custom kind of garments with my patients. I've had other seamstresses, like one of my patients had sapple to her mons and labia. And we had her wear postpartum garments and then did Velcro straps coming up like a flying squirrel from the back of the genitals up into her waist. So she pulls that for even stronger Velcro on it. And that has helped keep her 
um, adipose tissue from laying back down after the surgery. So you've, you've got to be as creative as possible and don't give up. There's something for everyone. You just have to keep trying different ideas, um, trying to talk with other therapists. Like I said, you can reach out. I'm more than happy to help that you just have to keep kind of looking for what would work for that patient. Um, unfortunately that does get you on some of the weird mailing list. Um, when you search different things, I've been locked out at hospitals for my searches. Um, so do oh make, sure, <laughs> make sure if you're hospital based that your IT department realizes why you are searching for um, female compressive underwear or male jock straps and stuff. So, <laughs> but there's a lot out there that we can find from other venues other than lymphedema that has worked great with my patients. And the whole part of the psychosocial impacts of these conditions, you know, we, you, you shared that quote from the woman who had lipedema and the feelings that it, it brought up about her husband's desire. I mean, that just really gets you. But then when you're trying to put your compression on and your mobility is limited and you can't do it, that affects your psyche as well. And so I also recommend always the support groups that are out there. We've made so many friends, you know, social media doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a very good thing. And there's so many wonderful support groups. And every month, Lympha Press hosts the Lymphedema Patient Roundtable and the Lipedema Patient Roundtable. Uh, you can just go, I'll put that link uh, when I send an email out to everyone afterwards, where they can hear from people just like themselves who are date, they're women that are dating, or there are men that are having challenges feeling just like they can't do what they used to do. And they feel, and they don't feel powered, empowered, you know? So talking helps so much. And I think that joining, linking arms with the communities that are out there can be a really helpful thing to the patients too. So with that, aw, so Renat uh, is out there and she says that she has the lympha pants. What is the lympha pad? Oh, I think you're referring to the lympha pod. That is for the bariatric patient. And that is a sleeping bag that if your lympha pants aren't quite big enough, even with expanders, we can move you into the lympha pod. So that's just to clarify that question. I have one more question that's here and we are running out of time. Have you ever used low level laser therapy with success? This is from Scott McAleer. Thanks for the question, Scott. So funny you asked that, that technically FDA, it's not approved. Um, I spoke with Anne at the, um, conference I went to in Palm Springs. So they're actually sending me a unit to start doing some case studies and research for them so that they can start putting it towards FDA approval. So that then just like with breast cancer, that the low level laser will be approved for genital lymphedema. So um, I will be hopefully starting that as I'm sure with Christmas time shopping or um, shipping that it'll probably be into the January frame, but I will be using some low level laser on patients to see what kind of results we're getting. Um, and I do have to ask, do y'all take the lymphopods and do sack races with them at holiday parties? I need to know for y'all's lymphopress party. You have I want pictures if y'all are doing sack races in them. Well, I'll tell you what, if that ever, I don't think that actually happens, but if it ever were, <laughs> I'll provide a visual for you that you can insert into one of your presentations. Mostly Thank people you. just like to relax, <laughs> hit the button. They can actually run it from their phone hit a button, boom, and relax, enjoy their therapy in the comfort of home. And they always have to go to the bathroom right afterward. <laughs> yes. And make sure it's eight full seconds. Means it's doing its job. <laughs> and also I was, I learned something that one to two bowel movements a day is normal. Yes. yes. 
Good to know. See, you never know what you're going to learn at a Lympha Press educational webinar, but I want to thank you, Dr. DiCecco. You were amazing. Okay. We want to have you back. Absolutely. Thank you to all of our guests tonight who participated in chat and just were there to learn right along with me. Thank you. We appreciate you so much. We hope you'll join us again for another webinar. We do them every month. We have roundtables every month. And if we don't get to see or talk to any of you before the holidays, whatever you celebrate, may it be wonderful. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank Bye, you. Dr. Pacheco. See ya.